I think before we can really talk about cups specifically, I think it's important to think about pottery in a more global sense, in its broader sense, as a part of the fine arts world. And for that to make sense, I think first we need to look at where fine arts is today and how it got here. Uh, if you think about art in the 20th century, uh, take the post-World War II period, what we call, now call the modernist period in art, um, the hallmark of that was what we called art for art's sake. In other words, it wasn't art. Art wasn't there to talk about life or life's issues. Art was there to talk about art. It was overwhelmingly abstract and it dealt with the things that made art unique, all of its formal characteristics, line, texture, mass, form, shape. Um, and this abstract, you know, it led to things like abstract expressionism. Okay. Uh, then in the 60s, there was uh, a realization that a lot of people wanted art to talk about more than that. And so what happens then is it's really the beginnings of the postmodern art movement, which is really a more pluralist combination of a lot of different movements. But one of the, the main things that happened is art began to talk about life. So in its beginnings, artists wanted to talk about the Vietnam War, they wanted to talk about feminism, they wanted to talk about race relations, about the world, about big issues in the world in general. And since then, it's broadened to talk about really all isn't really acknowledging life. And now we've moved into a period of time when art acknowledges and actively talks about life. But there is one great taboo that still exists which is art should not take part in life. And that's what the fine art world has not done yet, is it hasn't found a way that art can be an active participant. So art thinks about life, but it does so from the role of the critic, from the observer, from the outsider. Uh, I like to joke that art will, will peek in our windows and rummage through our closets, but it won't sit down at the dinner table with us. And that's where we come in. What's unique about pottery and, and a few other arts is that they are active participants in life. They can do all the things that modernism did. We deal with the formal aspects of it. And a lot of people who work in clay deal purely with the formal aspects of their art. Others use it as a way to communicate big issues and talk about uh, the same things that other postmodern artists in sculpture or painting would do. But for many of us, what we're doing is dealing with those and dealing with the experiential aspects of pot. What does it mean when a work of art becomes an active participant in the events of life, in the, the, um, just the day-to-day -day living of life? You know, how does that change the way that the viewer, to use that term, uh, interacts with the artwork? And to me, well, the, the way the fine arts world seems to look at that is that that's merely an impediment to creativity. That when you have to deal with function, even if we might choose to deal with function, the point of, as they would say, having to deal with function means that you have all of these restrictions on what you can do and what you can say and how you can go about saying it. To me, though, they've got that backwards. And in that, uh, if we back off for a second, what is art? Okay. Our art is a means of communication. And when we do it effectively, we're communicating on some level to other human beings or to ourselves. You know, so at its root, art is communication. So when we communicate, there's all different ways to do it as human beings. We can talk to each other. We can pantomime to each other. We can touch each other. There's all different ways to communicate from one human being to another. The fine arts world has chosen to forego touch. But it's a very powerful means of human expression, of human communication. To kind of put it backwards, to think of it in its negative sense, uh, we'll look at things that we wouldn't nudge with our foot. We'll nudge things with our foot that we wouldn't pick up in our hand we'll pick things up in our hand that we would not put to our mouth. We'll put things to our mouth that we wouldn't put in our mouth. So we have this intimacy hierarchy 
of which the visual is the lowest level. It's the most distant, it's the one that's the easiest to intellectualize. Touch is, is the most non-rational. It's the most intimate, especially intimate touch involving things like your lips and your face. As I say, there are very few things that we allow up here, very few people. So it's one of the great powers, I think, of the cup, the simple cup, is that it immediately enters the viewer's most intimate zone. The cup right away be, develops a level of intimacy that normally we would reserve for a lover, not for a general stranger. Now that's to me, is a great power, not a weakness. And so the things that we can communicate and how we can communicate can, can deal with these non-rational uh, subconscious or unconscious aspects of human communication. So it, put, that, that, that's where we sort of we begin in a general global sense, you know this relationship between the viewer and the object. Beyond that, what's wonderful about the cup or the drinking vessel is that it's a reflection of a lot of different ways to think about function, about utility. We know that if you go to buy wine glasses, you're going to be met with this array of different shapes and sizes and forms and types of glass and colors of glass. Part of that is purely visual. We like the way all these different things look. But also part of that is that people who are very serious about wine know that when you drink out of a different shape of glass or out of a different kind of rim or hold it in a different way, it affects the way the wine tastes. So there is both a functional aspect to those wine glasses and a purely aesthetic aspect. And it's the melding of that that makes wine glasses so interesting. The same is true when we're talking about a cup or a mug or a tumbler or whatever kind of clay object, a tea bowl that someone might drink out of, is that the shape of it, the texture of it, the color of it, the type of rim it has, the type of handle it has, will all affect the way that we perceive this liquid that we're drinking. Uh, I probably, if I had some really, really expensive coffee that I was going to serve you, I'm not going to serve it to you in a great big cheap mug. I'm going to want to serve it in something that talks about the fact that this is really expensive and you're only going to get a little bit and you should really savor this. This isn't your run-of-the-mill grocery store coffee. Okay, so there's all kinds of things that we can communicate then through a cup that I think is fun about our perceptions of what we drink from it. Um, we, we can also talk about the occasion. I think potters make a big mistake when we talk about function to treat it as if it were one thing. I, I call this the blue jeans principle. We go for comfort. Is this comfortable in my hand? Is this comfortable against my lip? Does it keep the beverage warm? Uh, can I put it in the dishwasher? We, we look at these things as if uh, function merely dealt with these most surface kind of issues. But function, when you're talking about human beings, is much more complex than that. So we wear different clothes to go to the studio on a normal weekday in the summer when nobody's around and I'm just going to get dirty than if I were teaching a class. Even though I'm coming to the same place, suddenly my role is a little bit different. The social interaction is a little bit different and I have to present myself a little differently. Neither of those outfits are going to be the same one that I would wear to the swimming pool. Okay? And none of those three are going to be the outfit that I would wear to a funeral. And that outfit, though I might be wearing it in a church, would be at least slightly different from the outfit I might wear to that same church for a wedding. Okay, so we can see that there, and then a hot day versus a cold day. Um, and again, all of the different levels of human intimacy come into this. The social aspects of, of function. When we're with certain people, we can dress certain ways. When you're with a lover, you might dress one way that you would never dress with anyone else. So, so all of this comes into play. Function is not one thing. And I think sometimes as potters, we do ourselves a great in, uh, disservice to think of function as a pair of blue jeans. When the reality is sometimes the most functional piece of clothing for an event might not be very comfortable at all. 
and yet it feels appropriate. You know, ask a woman on her wedding day how comfortable her wedding dress is. And my guess is she'd say, not very comfortable. But in another way, it feels great. It feels right. She knows she looks fabulous. She knows it represents the, how special this day is, that we hope it'll never happen again, that this is her day. And she's the queen of the world on this day. Okay? All of that is communicated in, that, in what she wears and how she wears it. So comfort and function suddenly don't play a very important role in that. And so when we think about a cup, I think and the act of drinking and the act of presentation and really take the aesthetics of it beyond uh, just the tactile to the experiential aspects of the pot. Then we really get at the root of, of that part of the aesthetics that's unique to cups, that's unique to pots. Not ignoring the fact that we're still going to deal with all of the, the visual aspects of it, as any artist would. And we might also be dealing with other content issues as well. But this is the part of it that makes us unique. Now, cups. I should talk about cups specifically. This is a cup show I'm jurying, right? How, how do I decide what's a good cup? and what's not a good cup, especially if I'm having to deal with images. Well, suddenly I can't, um, I can't deal with the experiential aspects. I can't deal with the tactile aspects. So as a juror, I have to try to look at the work and imagine that based on previous experience. Chances are I can do that to some extent, but I'm sure I'm missing out on things that I might notice, that I would notice if I had the object right in front of me and I could hold it and I could drink from it. Uh, especially if I could do that for a period of time. Sometimes our initial impression of an object isn't the same when we're using it as it might be after a period of time. Yeah. Um, so there's those things that I'm imagining. So a big part of what I'm doing, whether I hope to or not, is looking at its visual formal, compositional aspects. How is this person working with form? How is this person working with color, with texture, with massing, with balance? All of these things that we, that we all use to look at an object and say, ooh, that's really interesting, or no, that's kind of boring. Or, you know, everything in this composition works nicely except this one thing that really is jarring. Or that's really jarring, but it's jarring in a good way. You know, sometimes something that's completely resolved isn't as interesting to us, isn't as intriguing. We don't want to interact with it over a long period of time. It's something in which its composition isn't completely resolved. In the musical world, we talk about that as dissonance. And a little bit of dissonance, at least a little bit, is... Um, is really required to have an interesting composition that'll hold our interest over a long period of time. And it's the approach of the dissonance and the dissonance itself and the resolution of the dissonance that we all put together in music to think of as beauty. Well, I think there's a good analogy in art and that sometimes the composition that's completely resolved isn't as interesting as the one that grabs us some other way. So I'm looking at the compositional aspects of it. I'm also looking at the kind of statement it's making. Uh, content, there might be uh, overt or, or uh, unconscious, either overt or unconscious content there. Uh, oftentimes an art object, especially a ceramic object, will deal with history or culture and make references along that line. And I could look at it and say, how well does it do that? You know, what oftentimes the artist gives us clues. I'm making X, this kind of object. Well, by placing it within that context, then we can judge it within that context. And so I'll look, try to look for those contextual things, clues that the artist gives me when I'm looking at the piece. And to say, okay, this is telling me that it's a certain kind of object. How does it do as that thing? In a way, 
I mean, I, a cup show at least is a little narrower. When I'm jurying a larger show, I am comparing apples and oranges and bananas. And so I'm having to say that this banana is better than that orange, but not as good as that apple. So in which case, how do I decide that? And I realized long ago the only way that I could do it was to compare bananas to bananas and oranges to oranges and apples to apples and then pick the best from each of those to try to put an exhibition. So at least in a way we've got a narrower uh, task when we're talking about just cups, one kind of object. But still within that, think about all the different traditions. You, know, you have the English uh, teacup or you have a Japanese tea bowl or a Chinese tea bowl, which is different from a Japanese tea bowl or all of its modern variants that I, I tend to call drinking bowls rather than tea bowls because people drink all kinds of things out of them besides tea. Um, not to mention how is a cup different from a mug? And when is a saucer more visually interesting and appropriate than not to have a saucer? And what kind of saucer? And is this the kind of cup, I'm drinking a little water out of a beautiful Clarillion cup, Is this the kind of cup that rightly belongs in my hand all the time? Or is it one that really should sit on the table that I only pick up and put down and leave there? Those are going to make different kinds of demands and and allow me to... If, if uh, something is only going to be picked up and drunk out of and put down, the handle doesn't have the same... doesn't need the same level of comfort than if I... Um, uh, I'm going to walk around, say, the studio talking to my students, holding something for an hour during a class. I want a really comfortable handle if I'm going to do that. And maybe not one that's just one finger, but one that's two fingers so my hand doesn't get tired. So, you know, you're looking at different, different kinds of cups for different situations, even within the same day. I have a big Linda Christensen mug that I bought 15, 18 years ago. Um, it's a lot like this, but larger. And uh, I just thought it was really beautiful. And, you know, I just think her cups are gorgeous. And I love the casual way that she works with the clay. I love the way that this information on the surface talks about the softness of the clay, the rotation of the wheel, the movement of her hands pulling up the clay, this joint where the handle uh, is attached, again, talks about process. I mean, I can picture her making this handle, attaching this handle. And the color of this talks about the firing. I mean, you really, you know, it has wad marks and it has, you know, an area where the fumes in the kiln didn't reach the clay. And uh, and so I know this was fired. It wasn't just heated in an electric kiln. This was fired. It talks about fire. And I like all of those things. And I bought this big cup of Linda's and took it home. And she doesn't, or at least at that point, didn't glaze the rims of this. And so the first thing I noticed when I went to drink out of it is this rim was rough, kind of sandpapery. And I wasn't sure about that. I thought, ooh, that's not very pleasurable. And the handle had on that other cup had a much more pronounced ridge than this one. So when I picked it up with one finger, it really kind of dug into my middle finger there. And that wasn't very comfortable either. And so I didn't drink out of it much for a little while. But I would always see it there, and I thought it was really beautiful. So I made myself drink out of it anyway. And that cup was one of the best teachers I've ever had because several things happened. One is I found that the handle wasn't all that important. It was comfortable enough and I tended to use it when I was reading and I kept it on the table next to me and when I wanted to take a drink of my tea, I'd pick it up and I'd take a drink and I'd put it down. But there was enough feeling in the handle that I noticed the handle. I knew it was there. I knew the cup was in my hand and it would kind of pull me back from the book or whatever it was I was reading. The other thing that was really interesting to me about that is that texture on the lip. When I would drink from it, it would be like it reminded me I had lips. 
it would say, okay, here comes the tea, you better taste this. And what I found with really comfortable cups was I would be reading and drinking my tea and I would suddenly realize that I had this empty cup and I hadn't tasted any of it. When I drank out of that cup of Linda's, I tasted it. I was aware of the cup in my hand. I was aware of the tea in the cup and I was aware of the flavor while I was drinking it. It pulled me away from that world of the book and into this world just for that moment so that I could interact with that. Now that was a great lesson for me because before that time, like a lot of potters, I had thought of the pot as I think, and I can remember my grandmother who was born in the 19th century saying that when she was a girl, kids were meant to be seen and not heard. And I think in many ways we have that same attitude about pots. They should be seen but not heard. And what Linda's Cup taught me is that pots can have a voice and it can be an interesting voice and that dialogue can make daily life more interesting. And that was, it, it really opened up a lot of worlds to me in terms of, of how I thought about my own work and then also how I perceive other people's work. That somehow this idea of comfort wasn't the ultimate in terms of deciding what was a good type of function or a, or a, a, a less successful type of function. I have all of these cups and more. And when I teach a beginning ceramics class, one of the things I'll do is bring a rolling cart up here and load all and fill a rolling cart with cups. And I roll it down to the studio and we cover a big table with it. And then I have everyone just investigate. And they pick them up and they find the ones that they find more most visually intriguing, they have great shapes or beautiful glazes or whatever. And they're also supposed to pick ones that they think they'd want to use. And everyone hands them around and holds them. And I tell them as part of this, I want them to pantomime drinking so that they can know what that would feel like. Well, that's also so I can watch them. Because one of the interesting things I've noted through the years is not everyone holds a cup in the same way. And that there are several things that affect that. And so when we tend to pick up a cup and drink out of it, I drink out of it in a certain way because I'm a certain gender, I'm a certain age, I've had certain kinds of experiences. And other people drinking out of that same cup might hold it in a different way. So when I'm designing a cup for I don't know who's going to use it, how am I going to design that handle? What kind of handle? Well, I'm making assumptions about who's going to do it. Um, I'll give you a an example of a cup that could be held in a number of different ways. This is a, a cup made by Linda Arbuckle. Very beautiful cup. A lot of people like it. Now, I would tend to hold it like this. So it's in line with my forearm. And I'll hold it with uh, two fingers, generally. And because it's in line with my forearm, when I drink from it, I have to raise my elbow. I can't you know, otherwise it'd be going donk, you know, that wouldn't work. So simply by having it in line here, I'm talking about a certain way of drinking. Now what I've noticed is most of the men in my classes will hold a cup like this, but very few of the women will. Um, most of the women in my classes and others who I watch drink will hold a cup at more or less a 90 degree angle to their forearm like this. That's one difference. The other is, while men will tend to hold a cup with two fingers, even if you can fit three or four into there, tend to hold it with two fingers, except young men who are very strong, have big hands, will tend to hold a cup with one finger, no matter how big the handle is or how big the cup is. And they'll virtually always hold it in line with their forearm. So when I see women, young or older, pick up a cup, they'll tend to put more fingers in the handle and hold it at a 90 degree angle. And what that does is it changes the way you drink from it. So the elbow's down and you drink like this. So what I've noticed is there are several things that affect this. And then of course there are the people who hold it like this. Just ignore the handle altogether. Or will do this, put their hands through the handle and hold it. Or, um, uh, like this when something's really hot, like a tea bowl. Uh, so they're all different ways to hold this. 
the three things, I think it's three, that seem to mostly affect how people hold things are, are their gender, um, society. We have certain expectations of how people are going to sit if they're polite and how they're going to hold things and how they're going to interact with the space about them. Uh, and then and, and age. So, for instance, I said women will tend to hold it like this and men more like that. Over about the age of 50, that seems to change. And what I notice is as men get older, they'll tend with time to hold it more like this and to use more fingers. And it's reflected in their whole body English in that you know, a man of 65 is going to sit with their legs crossed close together and be more compact and tend to drink a cup of something more like this whereas a young guy is going to tend to be more like this. You know, cross their leg, their ankle at the knee, and they're taking up more space. And they're holding it like this and drinking like that. So age is one criteria. As I said, um, polite women in our society have mostly been raised to tell them, no, 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 don't sit like in this open position. You know, don't drink like this. You know, we're taught to... You know, there are ways to do these things. And so there's also societal expectations come into play in all of that as well. Um, I think strength has something to do with it too, in that people with stronger hands and stronger shoulders tend to envelop more space as they're holding things and drinking from it. And people who are less strong tend to have a, a, take up less space and to drink things, hold things in a more compact space. So, if I have a cylindrical body for a cup and I'm going to put a handle on it, one of the things I can think about is, how is a person going to hold this? And so, I can start by thinking about you know, color and mass and texture and form, like this wonderful cup of Clary's. But that candle could have been this high, or it could have been smaller, or it could have been up high or down low. It could have been wider, in which case, thinking of another. Now, this is a wonderful cup, part of a cup and saucer set by Matt Kelleher. Uh, Matt is a man, and he's made this, to me, very comfortable cup. And it's tea stained, because I drink out of this. But this cup is only comfortable when it's held in line with my forearm. You can't put two fingers in. And, you, and it's not comfortable to hold this way. This cup operates this way. This is a cup for someone with a strong finger, probably a man. Not, it's too big around, really, to hold that way. Okay. So it does what it does, and it does it wonderfully, but it's not the generic cup that anyone would want to hold. And... And uh, my guess would be that if I presented this to lots of different people and said, what do you think of this mug? Some people would say, ooh, that's really comfortable. I like that. And other people would say, mm, I don't think I'd want to drink out of that. It's not very comfortable. So depends on how you hold it. As I said, this one of Linda's is a great cup to pass around from person to person in a class. And one after another have, without telling them anything, Say, hold it, pretend like you're drinking, pass it on to the next person. Because it can be held with one finger, or two, or three, or four, or like this. Right? And it can be, I mean, this is probably as close as you get to a universal handle, in a way. Oh, and then there's tea bowls, drinking bowls. How form, how texture, how the lip affect our perception of the liquid inside. Um, a few years ago, that brings to mind something, I got to spend some time out at the Archie Bray Foundation. And I was staying at a potter's house there in Helena who had a lot of pots in his cupboard. And he had a great big tea bowl that I enjoyed drinking out of. I'd get up early in the morning, it was cool in his kitchen. I'd make myself a big tea bowl of tea and sit and with the newspaper and the reason I chose that tea bowl to drink out of was because it was big. And I just loved the shape of it. I loved the color of it. I thought it was really beautiful. 
Um, and it was a nice shape on a cool morning to hold in my hand. You know, the way I could cup it with my hands. It was warm and round and soft and very intimate feeling. But it was too big to hold with one hand. So when I took a drink, I had to stop reading and pick this thing up and drink from it because I didn't feel comfortable. I was afraid it would fall out of my hand if I tried to pick it up with one hand. So I'd pick it up and it really focused my attention. I was just drinking Lipton tea, plain old Lipton tea. Then the next thing that happened was, this is a big diameter thing, and I got my face in it. So compared to a normal little teacup, I'm really getting the fragrance and the warmth and the, the, the steam off of this tea. Then the other thing that happened was, very differently, I'm looking at this tea against a soft white background that really brought out the color. And, you know, it was a nice arc, so the color is very diffused on the inside. And I'm finding myself the tea, the warmth of it. And it was, I thought, this is a stand. Now, if you had just handed me that tea bowl and said, would this be a comfortable thing to drink out of? I said, ah, oh, heck no, it's way too big. Um, and it holds too much. Well, what happened is I would only fill it halfway up. And I would have argued. And, you know, when you put all the beverage in there, then it gets cool and you end up drinking some of it cold. Well, it's true. It did get cool. So I stuck it in the microwave and I warmed it up again and I drank some more. So all of those things I would have put forward as being real impediments, real problems, turned out not to be problems at all. I only knew that from using it. So it was another one of those little teaching moments for me when I realized that this interaction with the object was much more complex than I had given it credit for.